Welcome to Awakenings with Michelle Mache, the weekly dose of spiritual and metaphysical insights and information for navigating the soul path. Listeners are invited to call into the show for a reading or with questions and comments. Call 347-539-5122 and press 1 on the keypad. Also, join the Sacred Space of Empowerment live chat. To create a username, register with Blog Talk Radio. It's great to connect with all of you here. Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to the program. I'm Michelle Mache. Ooh, it's good to be here today. The five that will be coming on air is Lee McClowski, who's an artist, uh, actor, actually very well-known actor, and um, a bit of a metaphysician as well. And um, just very insightful. He's been on before and is always a plethora of uh, information and insight. So we're going to be diving in and uh, touching a bit on myths because we are changing our myths, our mythology uh, in this creation of the new paradigm. So we'll be diving into that. Welcome to the program, Lee. It's great to be with you, Michelle. Oh, great to have you back on as always. Um, Especially at this time, we've been talking a lot about deeper meaning um, and really transforming or revamping the myths that we we live by. And I know this is your world, your territory. Um, first, before we dive in, wh- what triggered you or what inspired you to look at myths in this way and, and to do these revisions, this revisionary uh, artwork? and uh, writings. You know, the the genesis of this entire process didn't come from a type of conceit where I thought, oh, I'll write these things or these things will come to me, but really started much more innocently as uh, asking questions. I, I, I was very fortunate uh, as a professional actor, which I started uh, back in 1975 in, in Hollywood, um, to really uh, uh, have a, a career that allowed me to uh, begin to understand that that the culture and the demands of professions uh, allow us to ask certain questions, but really the questions of the soul, of the heart, go mm-hmm. unanswered because they're not provable and they're not, uh, in a sense, accountable. They are really the poetry of our of our existence, and for that we have to cultivate uh, an environment that allows us to step away from the chaos of the world and, and begin to honor, uh, by giving residence to these possibilities, uh, you know, uh, where we live. And that's what I did for over 32 years. I, I be, it began with discussion groups. I, I would gather uh, people of like mind, shared curiosity, and we would read all sorts of different texts and ancient traditions and went through theosophy and uh, philosophy and uh, alchemy and all these different uh, considerations and uh, sort of the natural genesis of that was that I had always drawn uh, because I'm mm. an artist and uh, he had this wonderful expression he said when you can't talk about something paint it and so many of the philosophical questions and the stories and the traditions that we were reading I realized that that I could only get so far intellectually and being a very mm. visual thinker to begin with I started to sketch the ideas, and much to my uh, surprise, that I found by relating as I had as an actor, which means uh, we step into a Going deeper. Ah. Oh, Lee, now we have some people in the chat saying they can barely hear you. Is it possible either, I don't know if there's a volume on the phone or really placing it right under the the mouse, because... They want to hear what you're saying. Yes, um, this has been a problem. Let me see if I can um, uh, tell me if it's be- where it's better, and I will try and uh, it's find. It. Is that better? Let me know or? in the chat. It's getting better now. Okay, um, and if this, uh, let me see. Yeah, they said better. Better. Okay. Uh, how how much better? <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, oh, it, I'd say 20%. So if uh-huh. you can, yeah, whatever you're doing, if you could do more of that or bring it closer. Cause... Okay. And let me, I'm going to just try turning this up. Hold one second. Okay, uh, sounds good. Because your wealth of information, so I definitely want to. Yeah, um, okay. Now, is that any better or I'm trying to think. That's better. That's the better? First, 
Yeah, that one's better. When you said, is that any better? That was great. Okay, so right here? Yeah. Good. Okay. I'm, sorry. I'm on a cell phone, so this has the tendency to uh, drift in and out, unfortunately. And uh, okay. where I live uh, uh, has a dodgy uh, service, I guess. Um, but, uh, you know, back, back, is this, and so you can hear me if I continue to talk for a moment? Yes, please, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, just, just to bring uh, the question about where and, and how this developed, was uh, to, to make a long story short, I, I really w- asked uh, questions that, that, as I said, I began to draw, follow spontaneous creation or, or improvisation, which I had really learned as an actor, not trying to prove something, but to see where the energies themselves took me, very much like a character. You, you, you have a character, and you don't really know how to do it or what to do, except that you put it into the crucible of your imagination, and over time, suddenly the, the memorized lines fall away, and you really do energetically embody the character. So my questions as, as an artist led me uh, to begin with uh, the tarot, which I spent 17 years on, and that wasn't something I intended to do, but rather came out of a of a request from a friend, uh, Edwin Steinbrecher, who wrote, it was for his sixth revised edition of his book, The Inner Guide Meditation, which was based on Jungian Act of Imagination, uh, Natal Astrology, and the archetypes of the tarot. And I was very attracted to that, because when he challenged me with it, I thought, well, I really do want to know why is it that we are composed of these energies? What is the mythic mm-hmm. structure of who yep. and what we think we are? Mm-hmm. And that then led uh, to really just an evolution of my work uh, to to always utilize art and, as I say, the tools of creation, to ask mm-hmm. questions about the nature of creation. And uh, to, to a great extent, uh, my work is not the illustration of anything I thought I knew, but much more the revelation of a willingness to enter into the questions without an agenda, without a, uh, you know, in a sense, a, something I felt I needed to justify. And so it's really mm-hmm. grown out of love. It's grown out of uh, let's use our curiosity as our guide and see where our creativity and our imagination mm. take us. Uh, we've studied enough, essentially. It's, it's now how do we take the adventure? Mm. I love it. Now, how do you think and feel that our the 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 imagery of the tarot is changing? Do you feel it's the imagery that's changing, the meaning, the way it's expressed? Because we are yes, these archetypal energies. Because in this revisioning, are we updating the meaning? Would you say we're updating the meaning? I would say it's more like an archaeological dig. That mm. there's an assumption that it only goes so deep, and so we stop digging. But my right. questions weren't based on that agreement. I read everything I could, and I. But my curiosity wasn't ready to, in a way, say, "Well, another person's interpretation is what I can live with." Let me actually go deeper and deeper and deeper. And what excites me about what happened was that the drawings that I did really they're in black and white. And if we look at them as a structure, they really become the black and white keys of the piano, essentially saying that all of these unique notes are part of the greater instrument of who and what we are. And for many uh, thousands of years, we've been studying the notes, the difference between things. And what I found in my work was that it Mm -hmm. was actually like the wheel of the tarot coming full circle. I was coming home with the realization that the tarot, rather than being a belief system or a divinatory system, which is certainly part of it for some people, I found Mm -hmm. it much more uh, an embodiment system. How do we come to perceive this greater archaeology of our unconscious and have access to it? So yes, it is a because it's a tool rather than a belief system, it's constantly mm. going through a metamorphosis. And I really feel mm-hmm. the, the book that flowed through me, like the drawings, is uh, a very important um, offering for those interested in the subject because it will take them into the deeper mythic story of who and what they are rather than just trying to figure out the different notes uh, between things. Mm-hmm. Now, Lee, where can, uh, on Amazon, I'm sure, your book's available via Amazon? 
It is. It is. Next it's question. available on Amazon. It's also available through my website, which is uh, www.leemcloskey.com, uh, and uh, uh, Olandar, which is O L A N D A R. Um, uh, uh, dot com, which is the publisher. So it's, uh, but but it should be available on Amazon. And if you Google my name and you Google Tarot Revision, um, or you go to my site, it will come up. On my site, there are, uh, the, there's. If you go, you can read an example of the writing, uh, which is on the Justice Archetype. That's posted. It's a sample article. And then it says uh, uh, drawings, and you can click on that, and all 22 images will will come up. And if you have a chance, uh, really check it out because I, I really this is a labor of love. It's not something I was creating to try and teach people things, but much more like like a delighted uh, adventurer. I've realized that that because of my mm. relationship to it. It was able to move through me very much like a character without my over identifying with it personally and I, I think it's a it's a it's a very valuable tool because I've got a question it, from um Rhonda who's a feeder she said using it for a divination asking two okay two part question where she's heard that the tarot originated in Egypt do you feel it goes further back? And what is the tarot supposed to be showing us? The tarot is primarily a grand attractor pattern, meaning that its age is ageless because it's part of the very weave and structure of who and what we are. Uh, essentially, we can track it back to Egypt. Uh, the historical remains are primarily take us back to the Middle Ages, uh, but in a way, you'd have to say in terms of sympathy and in terms of a shared uh, idea, it goes back to Egypt. And we can find it really in all of the ancient art forms of consciousness, all of the ancient mystery schools, because the first question always was, if you look in the mirror, do you think you are seeing yourself? Because if you do, you are seeing the reflection of yourself, but you are not yet in connection with the roots from which you are growing. So the tarot really becomes, and tarot means wheel. It becomes the oh, wheel okay. that as we grow out of this wheel, we begin to understand that we are not partial or incomplete, but holographic, or in ancient terms, a microcosm of the macrocosm, the greater countenance mm. uh, and the lesser countenance. And all ancient traditions, which is what the tarot grows out of, is the quest to trigger not the ego's recognition, but actually the deeper self's recognition of its own instrumentation. And that as we look uh, at ourselves like a living tree as the outcome of all ages and time, then the tarot gives us an opportunity to access this greater uh, story that we are woven of. And so essentially it's a, it's a... It's a guide to helping us uh, perceive the archetypal and mythic structure of who and what we think we are and to begin to say if each of us are given this piano, this wheel of archetype, and each of us have a unique music, a unique story, it's to learn how to play this instrument wisely and to start to draw a human portrait that isn't simply locked in this sense of self-reflection and what is missing in me, but to turn inward and to realize, oh, I have the keys. This is why the tarot is called the keys, is because each mm -hmm. key will unlock a great treasure house of our deeper knowing. And it involves, of course, the imagination and empathy, which is uh, that, that uh, which will trigger through our creativity, our, uh, our personal expression, uh, a much more full sense of our humanity, because we labor under a very crippled sense that we are incomplete and that we are missing something, rather than what the ancients would say, no, you are the outcome of all of this, and therefore, with the right keys, man or woman, know yourself, and thou shalt know the mysteries of the universe. Mm -hmm. Now, Leo, is the um, tarot reflecting aspects of the soul? Yes. Essentially, it's okay. saying that you are... Uh, a sun, S-U-N. You are a radiant being. 
But to understand what composes this radiance, let's slice it up into 22 pieces of pie. <laughs> and these 22 mm. slices will each hold a unique radiance of this greater radiance, but by separating it, you'll begin to understand there's a language. And if you perceive the language, you will start to be able to draw forth the wisdom of these different uh, uh, conditions, these different doors, these different aspects of your greater whole and holy nature. A bit like taking a sphere and drawing a straight line through it in order to, uh, or you see the right angle a, a lot in Masonic and Egyptian and all, you know, in that, or the alchemist. And the right angle was called the squaring of the circle. And the squaring of the circle had to do with, because we are eternal beings in time, we are experiencing ourselves in unique conditions. Therefore, our wholeness, which nourishes us, is in a type of divided world. So only by accessing the things that bring a greater reunion uh, is, can we can we restore a sense of wholeness uh, to our greater uh, story that we are telling ourselves. And I feel that's where we're going with this whole soul alignment, connecting more to the soul, that ra unique radiance that you're talking about. Um, can you talk a bit about that, that this whole awakening, this whole shift that's taking place, it seems is more connecting to this energy or awareness or reflection that you're, that you're speaking of? That's a very good point, because everything in my work, I think, and what I like about when I have conversations amongst ourselves, you know, they're, they're, we're all on the same page. You know, I don't mm -hmm. really need to teach anybody anything. What I'm trying to do is to restore a sense that, you know what, we're much more interesting than we think. And finally, mm. a bit like Dorothy and the Wisdom of Oz, we're returning home. We're going to make sense of our black and white world, essentially, and the differences between things. But we will start to include ourselves in the picture. Because for so many ages, we have in this feeling of incompleteness, a sense that God is elsewhere, in a sense that we are yeah. them that we have journeyed with this, this yearning and yet this almost tragic despair that no matter what we do, we will die in a type of dissatisfaction for ever having been. And that's, that's really a, a theme that you can look at historically. And on a uh, positive side, that despair has brought out Beethoven, Michelangelo, the, you know, great poetry, because when we don't feel connected, our creative energies create something just not to go mad. And so this quest for meaning, I look at very much as what Carl Jung called the process of individuation, this journey through time and separation that has brought out of each of us a sense that we are uniquely ourselves. And this is very important because we came from ancient times where we saw each other in one another and in the community, a bit like being with the mother, where there's a sense of connection, a sense of source, a sense of meaning that has to do with life, and that's enough. Love is enough. But the question is, why did we separate? And I think the tarot is a very great example. I'm convinced that we separated in order to bring out the library, the unique qualities of each of us living a unique story. But finally, and this is what my art is getting at, is we are returning home. We are actually coming full circle to not mm -hmm. see ourselves in where we are not or where we think we have to get to, but actually as the outcome. And I go back to that living tree metaphor, that we finally stand upright rather than leaning into time with this ever crippling sense of we are not there yet, to finally say, this is who I am. This is what I bring to the table. And you know what? The question of being mm -hmm. human is so vast it had to be asked through all of us and all of our unique journeys. But when we come back together now, and this is the Aquarian truth, we will realize, like good theater or good music, that ensemble is the key. I don't know everything, you don't know everything, but you do know what right. you, and I do know what I know. And maybe together, if we share, we'll amplify each other rather than canceling one another out because we are afraid that if somebody takes something from us, we will lose ourselves, rather than if we gain together, we will be more. Oh, I love that, Lee. I love 
And I agree. So what you're part of what you're saying, and I like this approach that in the coming home, we're moving more into, if I'm hearing you right, coherence. We're coming together. Um, and, and also what I'm hearing you say is still understanding our uniqueness or celebrating that, you know, our individuality. But it's this coming together to, you say, amplify each other. Can you touch on that a bit more? Yes, and I can even liken it to the physiology of the two hemispheres of the brain. Because if we look at unique identity, that's the journey of the father. I think, therefore I am. Because when I think, I think I'm not you. I think I'm me. But the other knowledge is the knowledge of the mother and the ancestors, and that is the knowledge of I love, therefore I am. And when I love, I realize I don't share part of a humanity, and you are part of humanity, D, but each of us are uniquely whole and holy. And I really see the quest as this right angle in the human heart of how do we hold our unique identity and yet open now to the knowledge of I love, therefore I am, where we honor the truth in each of us is a unique, whole, and holy expression of being human. Hmm. So it really, it, it is that you know, coming together, that unification within and without is what I'm hearing. Yeah, and that's where family comes into being. In other words, not just your personal family, but the sense that your struggles uh, are not just your struggles, they're human struggles. Your pain is not just your pain, it is human pain. And when we experience mm-hmm. that, then we begin to perceive that the ancestors didn't have it wrong. They had human pain just like we did. And like we do, but what they are saying now within us is, you see, you are the outward face now in time. You, like a bud, beginning to sense that you are about to blossom, are the transitional phase in the journey of human consciousness that can now hold both this vulnerability of blossoming to the greater story, purpose, and beauty of our human journey, as well as holding in strength your unique identity. In other words, you will not be swept into hallucination, nor will you become lost. And this I liken Mm -hmm. oftentimes to the soft spot in the infant's skull when we are born. And we notice when you're parents, you see how your baby has this sort of awe, you know, and you really see the face of God, this absolute wonderment. Mm -hmm. Well, this soft spot is there. But as it hardens, you see how the vision comes into the eyes. And suddenly there's a focusing of this and that, uh, dark and light, because we have to learn the codes of this world. We have to understand the shared principles and laws and fundamental Mm. agreements of this world. But that's not the end of the story any more than the bud is the end of the story of the flower. What it's saying is that in the journey through these eyes of differentiation, it's to finally teach you, a bit like a gyroscope, that you can hold the structure of shared reality. But now, through self-determination, you can also trust this one soft spot, in other words, this sense of wonder, once again. And this is where I see a new union coming, which is that we will not be swept away into hallucination or dementia as we let these greater energies of wonder and possibility reinform who and what we are. This will create a new union, and that's why I see this relationship to the living library and the DNA, meaning that each of us hold in the DNA the living library of the whole of the human story, and therefore, as we see our unique disposition, our eyes, we will begin to understand that now we can trust, we will not be swept away, our greater imaginative energies. And in this new union, there will be a blossoming of creation and words such as beauty, fragrance, meaning, uh, shared uh, knowing will become more and more part of our, our shared human story. Because the two eyes just tell us things are this or that. I am for mm-hmm. or against something. But this is really bringing us into a new synthesis, I'm convinced. Mm-hmm. So are we we're revis- in the revision, are we reimagining things or is it new meaning to old uh, viewpoints and myths? You know, I really feel that that all consciousness is a bit like a tuning fork and that we Mm. strike the tuning fork 
of a great idea, and it resonates across the ages like a great uh, symphonic work of music. And it explores all of its conditions and possibilities until it becomes, in a sense, once again, that pure note. And this is what I'm seeing, is that, that when it becomes that pure note, we realize now we can strike those harmonics within ourselves, mm. and they will open up a greater field of vision. And that's why the myths, even Joseph Campbell said this, that the artists of every generation must reinvigorate the myths because they're not dead letter. They're not stories that were written, yeah. and that's it. They're the parables that can't be expressed in facts or science or, or belief. But really, it's the hero's journey. Each of us are on this unique quest to finally perceive that we are whole and holy and the outcome and therefore do have access. And if we trigger these notes with our imagination, just like Van Gogh is different from Michelangelo or one artist is different from another, we'll start to realize that it's not the one version that we are seeking or the one vision, but vision itself, meaning that, that uh, we mm -hmm. want to inspire each other. You can go places I can't, and vice versa. So tell me the mm -hmm. universe that is you, that you know, and you, you deepen my sense of humanity. So, Leah, are you saying that it's just, I love that you said, so it's not the particular vision, if I'm hearing you right, but to just even reconnecting to vision in general. Yes. In other words, that if we begin with the premise that we are each whole and holy, that we are the holographic nature of creation, meaning that each of us holds unique geometries, a unique blossom, but essentially we are not born of time, we are born of creation, and that as we enter creation, we unfold with a unique story, but like each blossom of a flower, you can't say, oh, the petunia is far more beautiful than the rose. You just say, no, they're unique. Mm -hmm. Blossoms. And this, again, is what the Maya were saying, is that the fifth world that we're entering is the age of, uh, of flowers. And I'm convinced, meaning that it's the age of honoring, as, as artists do, as musicians do, that you really want that unique blossom of another person's unique universe, because once again, when we come together, we will amplify the story and create a greater field of resonance wherein it's not just solving our problems individually, but in the greater radiant, radiance, we'll be reminded that we have so much more access to uh, a perception that frees us from too much indwelling on what's wrong with me, as opposed to maybe something is profoundly right with me. My story is mm -hmm. uniquely essential, even if I don't understand why. Mm hmm I find, I love what you just said about there's something, you know, right with me because I, I do feel um, so much time and even the idea of certain therapies has been on that what is wrong. And I feel like we're in this phase or have been, you know, for the last, I don't know, 10 years and getting more um, that it's it's what's what's right with you. And, you know, I would like to say go where you're, you know, celebrate it. You know, it's this idea that don't try to do that round peg in the square hole or square peg in the round hole. You know, go, where are you fully blossoming? And, and be there and celebrate that. You know, not in, in cutting off or I'm better than you're better, or, you know, any of that. But it seems like we are moving in this time, you know, this age. I mean, time is like an age of go where you are allowed to blossom. And this is something that, that I think is shifting, and it's, it's a type of, of node, in a way, that each of us are finding and gathering uh, with each other to begin to amplify that truth. You know, that, that for so long in the journey into self-reflection, we've been so keeping our self-image in relationship to what we're looking at that everything is based upon, am I taller, am I shorter, am I older, younger, yeah. smarter, stupider? You know, and that's not personal. That's in the very wiring when we take it back mm -hmm. to when this really all began with the outward thrusting ego that really did uh, take the quest away from itself because it, was, it, it felt condemned by the ever-growing sense, uh, you know, ever sense 
of lack and incompleteness. But what I find is that now hmm. the creative element here is it's not someone showing up from another planet or, or some religious figure returning. It's really the sense of theater which it, within each of us that says, you know what? The story we write about reality is based entirely upon the assumptions we hold. And if we begin to hold mm. different assumptions, they will begin to grow a different garden. That's why even the assumption that I am here to blossom will begin to awaken on a quantum level that possibility. And that, to me, is tr the, the true nature of where we are. In, it's like being a, a little child. At, at one point, communion is given to you. And then you grow up mm -hmm. into this difficult world. You're battered by it. You get, you know, in a sense, cynical about it. And then it says, now, even in this, can you once again reawaken your sense of innocence, your sense of wonder? Mm -hmm. Not because you've become unconscious and forgotten about all you've gone through, but to create a new partnership that lets you perceive that as you draw on an assumption that I am the outcome of a great journey called being human, maybe I can learn to forgive some of the things I hold so contemptible about myself and self-loathing is such a dynamic problem because we really have been convinced that our psychology is about what's wrong with me rather than what's right with me mm. Mm. I love that, that chain you know that open that, that blossoming that you talk about is then possible you know it's possible with that viewpoint I think it's very hard to blossom when the very nature of thoughts and actions is causing constriction which is what we had before right yeah yeah absolutely yeah and i, and I, yeah. I almost feel like the analogy would be that you know it, it's basically as some of us begin to tend the blossom a bit like flowers in springtime you know i'm convinced probably within the flowers they're all getting to the bud state because for a long time they were growing upward they thought we were getting somewhere and like the spearhead of the blossom you know of the bud it's taking the beating through all of these different weather conditions. And then it's there as this bud, and all it feels is a sense of constriction. Until finally, mm -hmm. I believe, a few flowers start to go, oh, what the hell? <laughs> Let me just <laughs> see what happens if I finally surrender and go, I don't know. I really don't know. I, I, and, and I'm convinced that that's in that sort of surrendering, we, we begin to open and other uh, qualities that we couldn't know in the bud state because we were so constricted with fear and a sense that we weren't getting anywhere begin to mm. unfold within us and, and for us, and the other flowers in the bud state start going, oh, 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 I didn't know that was possible. Oh, I thought mm. this was the end. I thought it's just where the bad guys win and we all lose and, you know, and yeah. die. You know, and, and that's what I'm understanding is that the new season is as we finally surrender to this sense, I like this version of being human better. And at the end of the day, if everyone's making it up anyway, what stories are you listening to? And yeah. why? You know, yeah, oh, I love that, Lee. Yeah, we have to decide to tell a better and more loving story of our own purpose and to begin by looking in the mirror and saying, I like you, thank you. What an incredible gift this human journey is. No matter how difficult and dark it is, at times, it is capable of blossoming into unex unimaginable and dazzling beauty. And that's what we see every spring when the flowers open. They didn't know they had it in them. <laughs> mm. And I think that's the same thing we're going to discover. We, we are so capable, and we've gone through this hardening process in order to finally support the blossom. But now it's up to each of us uniquely to blossom, to finally say, I like this story better. And oh, I love I'm that. To agree with the story I don't like, I don't have yeah. to do that anymore. And I'd say even like a, like like be a bit petulant. Say who says, and to what end? Why am I agreeing? I don't need to agree. Mm -hmm. Somebody tells me I'm sinful, or I have to fear my id, or that I'm 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 you know the product of meaninglessness. I say you can believe that math, but what does it add up to? Show me the art. Show me the music. Show me the belief in humanity that comes from this way of thinking and i'll listen but if there is no beauty no meaning no depth to these things other than a sense of despair i don't have time for that anymore mm. that was the gift of 9-11 you know i realized it's over i won't agree to mm -hmm. agree yeah and do you feel more people i love what you're saying to agree 
do you want to do you don't want to agree to agree to something you don't agree with do you feel that more are, that's happening with more people in this awakening it's like i don't want to play that game i don't want to do that why i don't want to agree to this anymore yes and i think that that's why bringing it home is essential that you can't do that on the vast general being against something oh the dark forces and this and that you know, it's yeah, not that one can escape those energies or escape the, the, the fury and the, you know, just that comes from seeing this remarkable uh, dumb show and noise that's going on on the planet right now. But I do think that, yes, we, we finally say, at least where I live, let me tell the story that I believe makes being mm-hmm. human noble and worthy. Let me share this with my children. Even if it's not reflected in the world, I will no longer wait for my neighbor to wake up. He is who he is. Let him treat his family yeah. well. But it is not up to me to tell him what to grow in his garden. It is up mm-hmm. to me to grow my garden. That mm-hmm. is the greatest empowerment on the planet that we have. You can't fight tyranny. You can't, it's sort of like what the Christians understood about the Roman state. The Roman state was a great killing machine. And so the point was they gathered in homes. They gathered around those of shared empathy and they said let us tell the story worthy of generation because this seed is not something that will blossom in our time but will be carried across the ages to finally blossom in another time and that's why i really feel that the key here is where we live it's how we treat those we love and to tell a story in our intimate circumstances that we then carry back out into the world of shared chaos and I think when enough of us uh, carry this uh, meme, exa- you know, essentially, it will it will shift the the gravity, you know, mental gravitational field of the planet, which is primarily yeah. in the panic right now. Yeah, but we have to do it. If I'm hearing you, you're saying the individually, we have to do it. And I love what you're saying. Really, unplug from the tyranny. So I, we, we keep telling people, you know. We're fighting with ourselves, fighting with others, telling them, oh, this is the way to do it, or this is, you know, better, or getting all into, you know, nitpicky. Uh, and, like, release that tyranny, you know. Um, but I am hearing you're saying it's, it's, it's individual to the collective. It is us changing the story, the myth. Um, it's, it's really coming from us is what I'm hearing. Because, essentially, going back to the flower metaphor, a flower does not blossom in its neighbor. It blossoms in itself mm. because it finally mm. says, I don't know, but I like this story better. So I'll hold mm-hmm. even if the rest don't. Do you know? Yeah. It, 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 and I think that that's our martial arts of consciousness. The Aikido mm-hmm. moment that says you can believe whatever you want to believe and those who understand the ways of tyranny, dominance, and power have had, like an old vampire, thousands of years of doing it. They're very good at it. So the essential, mm-hmm. and you look at that in a, in a larger sort of psychic sense, that that really is the tyranny of the ego, separated from any sense of its source, and that, that mm-hmm. it's caught in a type of self-reflection based on the tyranny of trying to control form. And what I'm talking about is actually the reawakening of the energetics of perceptions that says love conquers all, but it doesn't conquer as battle anything. It simply mm-hmm. says, I will inhabit this truth and share this truth with those I love, and that's what I will share with generation, because as a living organism, I like this story better, and that's enough for me. Otherwise, I'm against somebody, you know, and, and I, I, I feel that that's basically what creates us uh, the, the path of, of foolhardiness. Mm-hmm. You know, we have to I would tend to agree with you. Yeah, we have to be for what we believe rather than against what we don't believe. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's great in a way, a great template. I, I always think it's, I'm sort of in this, uh, you know, this training process of how to avoid the vortexes of reaction. You know, and to yeah. use my anger and my outrage creatively. I think that's why I'm so yeah. productive. Every time I get like gut rush, you know, yeah, exactly. you know, I just want to growl. Well, I agree with you, but that's transmuting the energy. That transmutes that energy into amazing creations. I mean, um, and, and I always say, if people were more creative, we wouldn't have war. You know, you don't see artists having war. Yes, you don't and, have and that, time. You know, you don't have time for it. Exactly. 
No, and that's, that's why I agree with you. I think that, that if we remember, it's not about being a painter or being a musician, but we are artists of consciousness, meaning the question is not a matter of the product you create, but your approach to creation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And our own creation. We are, and we are our own creation. Yeah, I, I mean, that's, yeah. that's the key. We are an art form. And, 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 as I, and again, going back to just I like that story better, you know, the, the art form, uh, Dolly said it great. He said, no lazy artist ever creates, uh, you know, a masterpiece. And I'm convinced we humans are masterpieces. And it's been hard work. But at this point in the story, we must stand up and say, I now allow myself to assume this simply because I can breathe when I think this way. I feel yes mm-hmm. rather than yikes. And I don't stand, even if I panic, and we all panic. I mean, there's a lot of dark stuff going on. We've got to, you know, hold hands and go, yeah, it's dark. But if we understand the alchemy, then we start to look at the darkness not as real, but as actual, like weather is actual, but it's not real. And because it is weather, then we say, well, what is it generating in us? It's saying, Mm -hmm. I will not devote my life to fear. I will not become less because another person tells me they are in charge. I will not give away my human soul for the sake of my panic. I will Mm -hmm. hold on to this. And as you say, the artist in us, and we are all artists, says use the materials you're given, compose the story you can live with, and when you do, you will realize it will begin to change Maybe not the world as it is, but it will certainly begin to change your perception of the world. And in that moment, you will begin to oxygenate your perception, meaning it's not something. You will simply be able to breathe more deeply. And when we breathe, suddenly that which was uh, constricting falls away. And we begin mm-hmm. to say, ah, I have more possibility here. Yeah. You, know, you know, and that's very important. Very important. Oh, Lee, thank you so much for sharing. This has been amazing. Um, we're out of time for today. Um, let's see, for more information, people can go to your website, uh, com, and that's L-E-I-G-H-N-C-C-L-O-S-K-E-Y. And also, Orlander, is that is there a website too? Oh, it's Olandar, uh, Olandar, Olandar. O-L-A-N-D-A-R, Foundation for Emerging Renaissance, which is okay. F-E-R. And that's on Facebook, but it's a community page, so anyone can go there. And both of those oh, sites good. Uh, connect to me. And if you want to contact me or you have questions, you know, please feel free. From my website, uh, the, you know, the, the emails come to me. And the same thing from the Facebook page. So, uh, and then I also post on uh, Return of the Divine Feminine, and I'll put artwork up on that as well on Facebook. Oh, perfect, perfect. And if you don't mind, you can even link to uh, our Awakenings Radio page. That way, people can go back yes. and forth. Oh, that's a good um, idea. And we'll put yeah, we'll put some uh, stuff up as well. I just I tweeted some of uh, what you were saying and a link to the program as well. But I think. Uh, you're really helping put a, a, a map, uh, if you will, to the awakening and, and what it, that means to us individually and collectively, um, giving that, that visual map, which I think is great. Thanks, Lee, for being here. Thank you so much. As always, it was a delight, Michelle, and uh, I look forward to talking again soon. Yeah, me too. Till next Thanks. time. Okay, bye-bye. Blessings. Bye-bye. And wonderful participant. Participant listeners, thank you also for being here and living more and more awake. Um, I so really enjoyed this um, divine awakening conversation with Lee. Uh, again, our guest was Lee McClowski. You can find him at leemcclowski.com or on our Awakenings radio page or the Orlander um, Foundation uh, for Emerging Renaissance, which is also on Facebook. So connect, connect, connect with everyone. We're really, it's about reaching out, stretching out, um, connecting, and sharing in these spaces with each other. Uh, as always, always continue to shine your light, share your insight, and of course, keep awake. 
Awakenings broadcasts every Wednesday, 12 p.m. Pacific Time. Archive shows are available on iTunes. For continued awakening conversation and insights, join the Awakenings group on Facebook and visit Michelle's blog at soulinsightsforspiritledliving.com. That's soulinsights, the number four, spiritledliving.com. Keep awake.